Welcome back to another episode of the Huxley Morton podcast, the show where each week we speak to pharma company owners and industry leaders sharing their stories of personal and professional growth. This week joining me on the show is my usual co-host, Mr. Adam Walker, and we are joined by Dr. Radhi Avrazina, the CEO and founder at Striden Clinical Research. Uh, Radhi, Adam, welcome to the show. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to do this podcast. It's a great pleasure. By way of background, I'm a medical doctor with a special interest in clinical research, that is uh, in conduct and evaluation of clinical trials. Mm-hmm. I'm a scientific lead and managing director at Strydon Clinical Research, as you uh, mentioned earlier on, James. Uh, Strydon is a UK-based, London-based CRO providing clinical trial support services. In this introduction, perhaps I should also say that I'm blessed to have had opportunities to learn my trade at some of the best CROs in the UK over the years. Prior to establishing Strydon, I co-founded Richmond Pharmacology, where for over 15 years I held the position of research director and helped making Richmond arguably uh, the leading UK phase one CRO. And that's where I met Adam. Uh, and we spent some years working together in that company. When, when was so, that out of, out of interest? Because it's I know that you two guys are sort of are familiar with each other. Adam spoke very kindly of you on the show not so long back, um, saying that you were one of the, the best mentors and, and figures that he, he knows in the industry. So how far back are we going there, um, ready to, to, to Richmond um, Pharmacology? Uh, you mean Adam and I? Um, I think that was 2004 or 2005. Uh, I brought in Adam to the business uh, and Adam helped me uh, set up the data management department because initially the company uh, started as a clinical trials unit and we were outsourcing uh, data management function. But then with Adam and a few other colleagues on board, uh, we set up uh, biometrics and data management. And I think Adam has proven to be uh, not only a great colleague, but expert in uh, what he is doing. Hence, Adam and I uh, continued now after our previous lives, we continued our relationship in, in different forms to date. I have to say he's, he's good at that. He's a, a, a serial network, uh, Mr. Walker here, isn't he? He does, he keeps in touch. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, a single transaction and move on. He's um he's always active he's always networking and yeah i guess pleasure to to be acquainted with him at at, at times i think i I think it's fair to say to to be entirely frank when i when i make connections with people i I stick with them because uh you know not only is it a small industry but actually um when you when one identifies with other people who have similar principles and values and and have that inner drive like i think i do and certainly raddy is an example of of someone who i've learned an awful lot from those those people stick with you and and i just have a very very close collection of professionals within my network and i think over the last few years it's probably expanded somewhat more than i intended it to but nevertheless you know raddy and i have shared some very very um, extensive experiences late into the night in finalizing all sorts of documents and processes and all sorts of things in early phase. And, and, uh, and as you say, James, you know, Raddy really was instrumental in teaching me many of the principles that I now really, really closely adhere to in every single day. And, per, you know, particularly when I go into other organizations and I'm advising and giving best practice, they're based upon the things that Raddy himself really taught me from, from the ground up. Well, interesting you mentioned this, Adam, uh, because I always had uh, a soft spot for teaching and training. I wanted to, uh, I find pleasure in sharing my experience and also being challenged by other people because every time uh, I teach or train other people, uh, I come across questions. Some of these questions are very challenging and you have to say, well, I'll check that later and get back to you. But a lot of these questions you, you make you think on your feet. And I really find a pleasure in doing that. Uh, perhaps, James, I should also mention that besides my um, contract research, commercial activities, I also do some teaching. 
I teach on clinical trials at um, UCL and uh, King's College London. Fantastic. And is there, um, in terms of what you do uh, on the CRO side and the teaching side, is there any specific therapeutic area focus or any speciality, Ravi, or um, is it a broad spectrum? It is more of a broad spectrum. Really what I cover uh, with, uh, we'll talk about Strydon and our services, but uh, me uh, as an individual as well, it is a broad spectrum from first into human uh, clinical trials to phase three trials. Really, uh, we are not specializing in one or the other therapeutic area. Mm -hmm. Okay, and look, I guess in true Huxley Morton podcast fashion, uh, we always like to know about the individuals and, and how you got into research. I know with Adam, there was a skeleton on the back of his um, door in his house that he talked us through and, and how he always planned to go down this route. But look, how, how, how did you find yourself in the world of clinical research? Well, did I always want to go down this route? Um, well, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> I, I stumbled across clinical pharmacology, I must say. It was very much accidental. Mm -hmm. um, I got first idea of what clinical pharmacology is uh, as a student uh, in the medical school. It was a short part of our internal medicine module, but I must say it never clicked for me. Um, I just didn't pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. But a few, a few years later, after I started working as a young doctor, um, I realized that I'm more and more interested in um, innovation, in patient care, uh, in improvements, uh, uh, in research. And then that was in West London. Uh, a friend of mine uh, said to me, well, there is that hospital by Ravenswood Park. Apparently, they have some sort of clinical research unit. So I thought... I'm passing by the hospital every day, so I may just pop in and inquire. Mm -hmm. And I popped in <laughs> in the unit. I knocked on the door, which turned out to be uh, a nursing station. And I said to the nurse, um, uh, I asked if there was anything going for someone like me. Uh, and I even humbly added, I uh, may even volunteer just to get involved. Wow. And I, I thought I may volunteer. I to do unpaid job initially. But the nurse heard the word volunteer. And then she uh, thought, I am looking for a place on a clinical trial as a volunteer. And she called uh, the screening doctor. So a young lady doctor comes to me uh, and uh, meets me in the corridor. And uh, she immediately realizes that I'm looking for a job. So she said, hang on a second, I'll call my senior colleague. Um, so she call, uh, calls her colleague and uh, we had a very nice and long chat all in the corridor. So uh, on the following Monday, uh, I got a call from the unit and they say, would you like to join us? You got the job. Wow. So how, that's how I started in clinical pharmacology. And fast forward uh, a few years later, uh, those two colleagues with whom I chatted in the corridor became my business partners. So the wow. three of us in 2001 set up uh, Richmond Pharmacology and built it uh, to be um, uh, at the time and for a long time, the largest phase one CRO in the UK. Wow. So yeah, so after speaking in the corridor, you ended up uh, a lifelong career in the world of, of clinical research. Well, yes, uh, perhaps that uh, brings us to, to the present day. Um, um, after uh, spending my time uh, with my great colleagues at Richmond Pharmacology, uh, there came time when I um, uh, decided to sell my shareholding in the company. And um, at the time I felt, um, well, it's after I uh, sold my shareholding, uh, I felt it was too early to retire. I was still enjoying the job. Mm -hmm. um, and then, 
How I, big was the company at that point, uh, by the way, Raddy? Could you say again? I, I was just wondering how, what size was um, the company at that point? Because I understand it, it wasn't just yourself and, and the business partners by that point. It had turned into quite some business. That's correct. Uh, Richmond Pharmacology um, uh, for uh, many years has uh, around 100 to 150 employees. So it was uh, quite, quite a large uh, uh, phase one CRO. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, by the number of beds uh, in two clinics at the time, uh, we were the largest uh, phase one CRO for a number of years. Wow. The largest phase one CRO in the country. So talk, talk, talk me through, I guess, some of the growth on that, because that, see, I mean, we're, we're looking back on it now and it's almost like a, a snapshot. But how, how did that feel over the years from going from that conversation in, in the hallways to all of a sudden you're running a business of 150 people? Um, what was going through your head at that time? How, how, what did life look like for you, yourself at that point? It's, it's like a good football team's manager. Uh, whenever they are interviewed, they say uh, they look at the next game and they don't want to think about the future. So I think that was an element of it uh, with us. We always wanted to be the best in the field. We wanted mm -hmm. to outcompete everybody else. And I think that was uh, something innate, uh, something uh, in you, uh, which you... Uh, bring to the business but at the same time um, you can't look too far because there are so many hurdles and in overcoming hurdles sometimes adversities you become stronger and I can give you an example uh, our first clinic was in West Wimbledon mm -hmm. it was Atkinson Morley's hospital and there was a time uh, which came suddenly when we had to um, actually uh, relocate but our other clinic was not ready. So we had to find an alternative ward in a different hospital. And mm. that was uh, St. George's Hospital. So in that very challenging situation, uh, we managed to come out of it having two clinics without going into greater detail. So this is just an example how an adversity and coming through it uh, can make you stronger, bigger. Uh, and better fantastic fantastic well it sounds like clearly that that went well you know in terms of what what you built there um you know what were would you say are the, were the the best parts of, of what you um were doing and, and what you do and, and the, the worst parts the most challenging what would you how would you describe um yeah the, the pros and the cons of, of that journey well, the journey itself uh, is, is exciting. Uh, there are always tough moments, but most of it is nice moments. It's pleasure of working with great people uh, mm -hmm. and achieving. I think this, the greatest thing uh, about building a company is uh, reaching the heights, which uh, we were lucky to reach uh, with that company. And I'm glad to say the company is progressing and still flourishing. I think there was also something that, that stood out for me when I was part of that organization was really the absolute drive that came from the leadership down. So yourself and your colleagues, as you described, Raddy, you led by example, you lead by example, you only ever do the best possible work you can do. I never remember you being anything other than the first one in and last one out. That was absolutely your principle. And whether or not you ever said that to anyone, you demonstrated it every single day. And when I think about, you know, to your football analogy, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the best players, you know, the likes of Ronaldo and, and Messi, they're the first ones out on, on the training pitch and they're the last ones there to put the balls away. And that absolute drive for improvement all the time sets the bar. You set the highest level of bar. And I haven't seen that example set in any other organisation I've ever worked for before or since. But certainly that's pretty unique. And I think, you know, you and the other directors led absolutely from the front with that. Yes, I agree. And I think uh, specifically phase one, early phase of clinical research, um, it's not for faint-hearted. No. You need to have it. In order to succeed and um, 
uh, stay in that kind of business, uh, you need to love it and you need to have resilience and stamina. And of course, uh, if you stay uh, in this area, uh, there are a lot of rewards. Wow, impressive stuff. Uh, and look, having done all of that, um, Raddy, you've now decided that it wasn't time to retire, which probably goes back to the work rate that Adam has just been talking about. Um, and you've decided that you're going to start another CRO with Striden Clinical Research. You're also going to be um, doing lecturing and, and, and teaching. Um, so look, clearly you're a man who likes to be busy. Um, give us a snapshot of your current situation at present. So when, when did Striden start? How are things going? Well, we started Striden in 2018. Um, so I thought, um, okay, well, I want to keep myself busy. I like what I'm doing. It's too early to retire, as I mentioned. And um, I then decided to set up a new company, new contract research company. But the question was, what kind of company? I didn't want to do the same old. I didn't want to repeat the same thing uh, all over again, everything what I did uh, when building Richmond. Um, but the question was <laughs> what to do and uh, what is different that I can make. Plus, um, I felt that the prevailing business model for delivering contract research was uh, getting a bit outdated. And then that's how uh, the idea of Strydon was born. Um, uh, Strydon is set up and run as a cooperative of experienced partners, all experts in their field, and with an equ equitable share in the proceeds of the business. Mm -hmm. So this setup allows us to be agile, uh, run the business without uh, high and often clunky overheads, and really concentrate on what we do best, and that is uh, providing uh, clinical trials expertise. Mm -hmm. And for the better way of explaining, um, perhaps uh, I can say also that it's a, uh, the company's business platform is very much a cross between, let's say, Uber and a law firm partnership, taking best of both worlds, if you like. I was thinking that when you were talking about people having almost a stake in the business, that's how I was envisioning it, a law firm partnership, you know, everyone's working together. Um, and then with the Uber, almost that freelance element to it. And often as a recruiter speaking to CROs or, you know, startups, we offer contract solutions to help them grow scale. And they don't have, I guess, as you uh, labeled it, the, the kind of the clunky overheads of, you know, big recruitment costs or fixed term employees. And you can often be more agile. Um, but I guess in itself, that perhaps creates its own challenges. Um, so, you know, what, how would you describe the challenges that you have faced in the last 18 months? And with it being different to, to Richmond Pharmacology, what has, has that perhaps taught you about yourself or what have you learned about yourself? Well, perhaps before we move on to that, I just wanted to uh, finish my previous thought and, and mm. say that um, despite uh, this a relative novelty in the business platform which we, which we are using at Strident to deliver our services. Um, our core values are stubbornly traditional. Uh, we deliver honest quality service on time. I think this needs to be stressed because it is very important, not only uh, for how we feel when delivering these services, but also for our clients to know because that's uh, how we manage their expectations. And they're always expecting uh, a very good value for, for their money. And that was always front of my mind. Yeah. An honest service which people can trust. And this is what Strident is about. <laughs> Going back, back to what you said about the challenges in the last 18 months, I believe, obviously, uh, well, there is no point in hiding the elephant in the room. Um, the pandemic has affected us all. Uh, there is no point in pre pretending otherwise. Um, uh, clinical research is no exception. At Strident, we had to readjust our plans as well. 
Now, planned expansion into clinical trial site management had to be put on hold. Mm -hmm. um, but this also meant that we could channel that energy and effort into other parts of our portfolio, which then created a new business. So I guess with this, it is the case of turning adversity to your uh, adversity uh, to your advantage. Definitely. Plus, we are all witnesses uh, that uh, we are um, uh, uh, all using remote working, for example. Uh, this has become the norm. It was part of our delivery platform already. And whereas in the pre-pandemic days, uh, this could have been seen as a disadvantage. Uh, Nowadays, uh, we are like fish in the water. We didn't have to uh, adjust at all. So that created new opportunities as well. Nice. Adam, it, it seemed as though you were about to jump in uh, with something there. If, if you can revert, revert your mind back a moment or so, um, what was it that you were going to try to pitch in with there? I've completely lost my train of thought. Completely lost my train of thought, James. But, and, but well, I don't worry. It happens to the best of us. But, but to be to be entirely <laughs> frank, just just to follow on from what Bradley was saying, I mean, the the agility with which with which um, he's been able to pivot, I think, is also a testament to the you know the the size, but also the organisation, and that's how many companies have succeeded over the last eighteen months to two years. Is really through the connections that we're making now and using the media that we now take to be de facto standard mm. you know, this this podcast itself didn't exist 18 months ago this came and was born out of a pandemic situation where we needed to connect with people and and i think you know really you speak to the point that connection is 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 that point isn't it it's that differentiator but also you know as a respected individual in the industry your your reputation your reputation precedes you but also i think the media with which you then are able to flex and move and adapt to that situation is is, is also um, what you've described really isn't it absolutely and the the, the upshot of of the of the last 18 months specifically we don't know uh what will be next year or the year after but really the upshot is when facing challenges you need to adapt keep reinventing yourself show resilience and then hope for the best agreed agreed i think what helps with that, Rabbi, is perhaps the core values that you've just spoke about, you know, a kind of, you know, honesty and integrity. If you've got that, you know, customers are going to, you know, they're going to buy into you. They're going to stick with you. They're going to send more business uh, your way is, is what I believe. I did remember my point, James. The back, point I was going to make was... Back to you then, Mr. The, Walker. The point I was going to make was the principle that Richmond always always uh, espoused was that you know if you commit to do something you do it and if that delivery date is friday it gets done by 11 59 p.m on the friday but it gets done and we always always delivered didn't we really that was absolutely the principle and i i can honestly say there are no other cro's that commit and deliver what they say they're going to do in the manner that that i learned really really from from Rally and, and the team at richmond Yes, uh, and I think this is this is the uh, ethos uh, which you um, either inherit. I, I'm uh, uh, more likely to believe you learn uh, and adopt, uh, and that ethos actually helps you to go through difficult moments. I mean, speaking of Friday evening, uh, Adam <laughs> and uh, finishing the project because you promised to deliver. Uh, it is an important thing. In my uh, younger days, uh, when I was interviewing a, a lot more uh, young colleagues uh, and, and employing them, um, I would very often uh, hear what I find to be a cliche, to be honest with you, uh, often. Um, I am a team worker. So I asked them, what is uh, a team worker? What, what, what do you think by that? And I then, to help them, I give them a scenario. It is... Friday evening, it's six o'clock. Uh, <laughs> two of your colleagues have to stay behind and they, they may finish it at midnight. And you've got a um, um, pub crawl <laughs> to join. <laughs> so what would you do? You know, and then <laughs> things in, people realize what teamwork is. It's working together, but also helping your co colleagues uh, when they go through a difficult patch. 
but it never it never leaves it never leaves you it never, it's never left me really you know it's absolutely in in my in my dna and and i can only <laughs> i think thank you for that <laughs> Great, it's a great. It's interesting, Maddie, um, because I I also share that. I think Adam does. It's you know finding individuals who just deliver on what they say they're going to do is often is tough yeah. uh, for any business owner. And you know it's certainly what I look for. You know I'll take that over pure talent any day of the week. It's good old steady Eddie that will just hit a deadline. I'm happy with that. But where did where did that habit get ingrained? To you, was it maybe from childhood, your parents? Where where do you think it, it came from? For me, it's always been perhaps my sporting background. Um, what's yeah, what's what's made you like that? I guess. I guess a bit of everything, uh, because um, I've seen uh, kids with uh, uh, excellent upbringing, and then things uh, go pear shaped. I've seen uh, people not having a nice childhood and becoming great individuals in their uh, adult lives. Mm. So I guess it's it's both uh, what you um, get in your genes, but uh, also uh, what you learn through your life. Sometimes uh, difficult times uh, teach you better than anything else. So I think it's a combination of different factors. Sure. Nice. In, in, I'm always interested to yeah know kind of what makes people tick, tick really. Um, yeah, as I say, for me, it's always been the, the sporting uh, background and kind of going back to what you said at uh, Richmond Pharmacology, wanting to win, wanting to outperform whoever it is, whether it's now it's, it's recruitment. It used to be boxing. Before that, it was football or soccer for our US um, viewers and, and listeners. But it was always just wanting to yeah kind of get get that recognition of yeah the the, the victory as it may be so what, at whatever kind of cost within reason I would make sure that I delivered from my end and that's kind of all you can do and you get a reputation for that don't you I think yes absolutely and uh, having a competitive streak there is nothing wrong with that uh, I am I'm, uh, one of those people who like to out compete, compete if you like um, uh, others and competition. If we don't, and there is someone better, we take our hats off. Mm. Uh, but if we do, we enjoy the moment. Yeah, definitely. I guess, and win or lose, it's, like for me, it's, it's just knowing that you've done all you that you could. So it's delivering on those deadlines. It's turning up when you said you were going to be there, etc. Um, so that, that, I guess that brings us kind of up to speed with, with, with um, to where you are, how things have been over the last 18 months. But what are, the, what are the plans moving forward? Because I'm sure for anyone listening in, for a man who's started to CRO, built it to 150 staff, probably quite comfortable, um, could have retired, but you've decided to do it all again. Um, it'd be great to get an insight as to what are the plans moving forward and what hacks or tips and tricks aside from work rate, would you give to anyone out there who's looking to, to perhaps do the same? Because any business owner I speak to wants to scale. You've been there, you've done it. What are the plans moving forward? Talk us, talk us through the, the blueprint. Well, first of all, let me uh, just uh, give you a few more details uh, what we do at Strider. Mm -hmm. uh, we offer our clients uh, clinical trial support services, as I mentioned. That includes regulatory affairs, uh, medical and scientific writing. We uh, do study designs. We um, put together uh, clinical trial protocols, CSRs, clinical study reports, IMPDs, investigative brochures. We do quite a bit of training as well. Um, just before the pandemic, for two years running in collaboration with our colleagues from UCL, we trained, for example, Saudi FDA assessors. They came here. Uh, as I mentioned twice, uh, they've chosen to come to London, which is a great testament to uh, clinical research excellence in this country. They didn't go to the States or somewhere else. Uh, and we are proud to be involved with that. We do also GCP and GMP audits, clinical trial site management. So how do I see the future? Where do we go from here? Um, I very much uh, think that um, we will continue doing what we do and what we enjoy, 
which is uh, a very important factor in this. Because if you don't enjoy something, uh, better don't do it. Mm. And what we enjoy and what we are good at is providing expertise for clinical trials. Um, I'm surrounded by um, the most brilliant colleagues and collaborators with uh, whom I, many of them, I worked for many years. And that is a great privilege, pleasure uh, as well. Our business model with partner collaborators is proving to be a success and our client base is, uh, is expanding. Um, in terms of uh, future plans, I think we need to be realistic. Our intention has never been uh, to be a mass producer of uh, clinical research services, because let's face it, uh, we want, even if we wanted, we could never compete with the big guys, uh, with large multinational CROs. We are just a small fry for them. Mm -hmm. But we are a respectable niche player, a boutique which provides top-notch clinical research services in a nimble and a flexible way. And on this, James, I'm proud to say we can beat anyone. So it's more, more of the same kind of, I often have a, a conversation with, with clients about our niche focus as, as it may be and I say look we don't cover everything because we're, we're not huge but we're kind of inch wide mile deep mentality rather than you know a mile wide only getting you know scratching the surface for us we're not interested in that we'll leave that to the you know the big boys of the recruitment world you know the manpowers the haze you know we are if you need an expertise in a specific area that's us we will you know we'll get in we're embedded with the market etc and that's our, our area of expertise. And it sounds as though your values and focus is, is kind of similar of focusing on being the best in your, your areas. Absolutely. I think what you just said resonates very much with me. Uh, and because there is no point in uh, spreading yourself uh, all over the place, mm. uh, trying to do everything or being unrealistic about your goals because you need to take one step at a time. And if that takes you further than what you ever thought, so be it, great, you know, we'll celebrate this. But I think being, uh, or having a dose of realism um, uh, and the competitive nature, don't forget that, uh, will take you, take you far. Mm. Okay, so look, I guess on the, the point of um, expansion, often when you're good at what you do, people start, you know, almost flocking to you. I know often, for me, I end up turning away business because people have, have seen what we're, we're, what we're doing. They've got recommendations from friends or colleagues or other business owners. But it's maybe not in our field, but when it is in our field, we're able to take on the business, take on more staff, um, et cetera. And at the moment, that's exactly what's happening. Um, what are your, I guess, further plans for expansion, innovations? And is there any general predictions um, for the market, whether it's the CRO market or the, the pharma market and life sciences in general? Um, I think, well, uh, speaking of the market, um, uh, after the challenges of the last 18 months, uh, our experience is that the market uh, is as buoyant as ever. And I think this is likely to continue, certainly uh, from what we could see. But the things are changing in the way we do clinical research. Uh, there is an increasing role for the technology, uh, for the use of technology and artificial intelligence, telemedicine, wearables, and so on and so forth, remote assessments. Um, and I'm sure your previous interviewees uh, would have touched upon this. And there is that concept of decentralized clinical trials uh, where uh, uh, as opposed to traditional trials, which were uh, predominantly or almost exclusively done in the uh, brick and mortar clinical trials units and hospitals, these centralized trials are done more in the community at patient homes. Not all of them, but whenever and wherever uh, it is possible uh, to do such assessments safely in such a setting. Mm. So uh, this, this concept has been around with us for a number of years, but it never really took off 
until now. And I see more of that happening. And we would all, including us at Strident, we will need to adjust to that. Um, it is a great thing because uh, this concept is more patient centric. It's more cost efficient. Uh, it may um, increase uh, recruitment, volunteer or patient recruitment rates um, and um, speed up um, uh, drug development, which is a great thing if you think about how long it takes to take a drug, how, how many clinical trials and testing it takes to, to get the drug to the market uh, somewhere between eight and 12 years typically. So if you can shave off some of that time by using novel concepts, then that is a great thing. I don't want to sound uh, James as someone who's just waiting to jump on the bandwagon of everything and anything that is fashionable um, just for the sake of it, far from it. But um, I have to say that we mustn't get stuck in the old ways uh, in the way we think and just say we are doing it the way we do because this is how we always done it. Um, there is a great saving, uh, saying um, which goes that um, the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stones. It ended because people developed alternative tools. So it is a very telling reminder that we can't just fall asleep at the wheel. Uh, we always need to be on the lookout for innovation, for improvements, for the things which will uh, make our work better and smarter. And I think um, a stride on, and our philosophy in that environment is going to thrive. Brady, I'm bursting to ask you a question that I haven't asked you before. Um, in your experience, your extensive experience, did you ever think that there would ever be a situation where a virus would come to pass for which there would be a vaccine produced and in people's arms in the speed in which we've experienced in the last couple of years? I must be honest with you, I never thought about it at all. Um, so um, in the beginning, when people started talking about um, uh, getting the vaccine done within a couple of years, because we already, uh, or the pharma industry, had platforms built for other viruses and other vaccines, um, it sounded very ambitious. But I think we are human beings. Uh, inherently hopeful. So uh, although it was ambitious, uh, I very much hoped it could be done. And I must say, uh, I was very, very surprised when uh, a vaccine was very much done within a year. So the answer is yes, uh, I was surprised. Me too. <laughs> I was telling people, including my parents and any friends and families and anyone around who wanted to hear, I, I thought if they did it in under I don't know, three to five years, I thought they were doing amazingly well. And I just told anyone that I cared for or, or came into contact with just to hunker down and, you know, stay safe for a while. Um, because that was my perspective. I'm just very curious to, to hear your side of it because... And I I, we, we must uh, give uh, huge credit to, to those who worked on the, these vaccines and uh, help develop them and not only help develop them but really test them in those clinical trials to um, prove uh, uh, that what has been the case at least up to now that they are safe for administration yeah absolutely thank you thanks for answering that because as i say I, I i've been meaning to ask you this for a while actually and this this felt like the perfect opportunity <laughs> we'll do these po podcasts more often uh, so <laughs> we can actually cover various things adam yeah, we'll just continue to pick your brain, uh, Rani. But no, no, it's um, interesting to hear you talk about, yeah, I guess the, the advancement in, in med tech, AI, digital health. Um, Adam and I are often speaking to people at, at, about this. Um, at, at the moment, just everyone is just so busy. Uh, the sector is buzzing. I know that Adam is working all hours under the sun. He's, you know... Even on things like Clubhouse, Adam, I know that you're you're active um, 
on there having various chats about decentralized trials and, and all sorts of things, aren't you? There are so many platforms. As I said, there are so many platforms and forum where, where you can meet like-minded individuals who share that passion and drive and, and zeal for, for change in and around drug development and, and research and technology, as you say. I, I've, I've had to take a little bit of a step back over the last couple of months because I was just finding I wasn't having enough time to sleep, to be quite frank. But there are so many, there are so many opportunities to connect with like-minded people these days um, in and around this space. And it's never been more vibrant or buoyant, as you say, Rowdy, um, as we're experiencing today. Which is, which is great, great news. Uh, and uh, I remember now, many years ago, when I was uh, setting up my, not Strider, my, my previous company, Richmond Pharmacology, uh, and we were looking for investment. And really, the advice uh, we were given at the time, you will easily find investment because in times of war and peace, people will always invest in healthcare. Uh, and this is, um, up to now at least, proving to be the case. And that's why I think. Uh, the clinical research market, pharma market, is as buoyant as it seems to be to all of us right now. Yeah. Which, yeah. as I said, it's, it's good news. It's good news not only because business is booming, uh, people are having their jobs kept or new jobs uh, being created, uh, which is good for, for the whole country and the economy. But also, uh, it is good to know that the progress hasn't stopped. Yes, we may have a temporary setback or setbacks when uh, many trials last year were put on hold uh, or some of them even terminated earlier. But it's good to know that this is all coming on board now and we are cutting on uh, for the greatest good, uh, delivering really improvements in healthcare. And as I said uh, to you uh, in the beginning of the podcast, this was one of the reasons why I always liked research, always wanted to be part of it. Um, from the time I graduated at the medical school uh, up to today. Fantastic. Well, look, it's been great hearing a ton of your insights. Um, I guess look, the only disappointing thing with um, this podcast is that we only have a limited time and, um, you know, at some point we have to bring it to a close. But before we do, Raddy, I know that Adam and I have been picking your brains with various questions, but we've got a bit of a quick fire round uh, for you, which I'll kick off with um, our usual set of questions. And, and the first one from my side is what is the number one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? It is something I've learned over the years, which is always be yourself. I like it. I like it. Now, I, I know you're someone who does a lot of reading, Raddy, but our, our listeners are always keen to understand from, from leaders in the field what they're reading, what's on their bedside table, what's keeping, what's keeping their mind active when they're, when they're not working necessarily. Um, what is it on your bedside table that you're reading at the moment? Um, uh, I'll recommend something which uh, it's not brand new. Uh, it was a book, I believe, published in 2014, 2015, thereabouts. Um, Sapiens, uh, A Brief History of Humankind. I read it for the second time this summer. Um, um, you may not agree with everything what is in that book, uh, but it is a great uh, read and uh, I would thoroughly recommend it. I love it. Yuval Noah Harari. Amazing uh, book. Absolutely game-changing book. I love it too. You can't, and, stop, um, you can't stop reading it. Even when staggering. I staggering. Even when I was doing it for the second time, it really, it's a page turner. He's a brilliant man. I've listened to him on many podcasts, funnily enough, and he speaks as brilliantly as he writes, funnily enough. Oh, I got to do that as well. Yeah, he's really great. <laughs> Good to hear. Well, look, um, you've already built one company. Um, you're now in the process of doing it again. Um, good luck to you. Um, but look, what would you say are the top three qualities that you value most when looking to bring people in um, to, the, to your teams? That's an easy question for me. Um, intelligence, integrity, and hard work. Straightforward. I like that. Awesome. Um, when, you're not, when you're not working, Raddy, what, what is it you do for enjoyment outside of work? 
What do you enjoy doing? Uh, what I enjoy? Um, well, Adam, anything that is easy on the eye and good for the soul would be my answer. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Very oh, good. Very good. Do it. This would we'll, we'll do our own. We'll, we'll, we'll connect our own dots with that one. <laughs> I knew that would please you, Adam. That's good. Oh, look, finally, uh, Raddy, what is your number one rule for, for life or for business? Or for both. Oh, yeah. Um, in, in business, I would say that if you want to reach for the top, you must get out of your comfort zone and stretch yourself. Uh, in life as a general, whenever you can, um, do things that make you happy, whatever floats your boat. Fantastic stuff. Well, look, Raddy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. As I say, I'm sure Adam and I could continue to pick your brain for hours and hours. Um, but look, very much uh, appreciate all of the insights. And look, for anyone that is looking to follow Striden, follow yourself, reach out to you. What is the best way for anyone to do, do that? Well, for those who are uh, or may be interested in uh, our services to hear a bit more, more information can be found on our website. That's stridenclinicalresearch.com. Mm -hmm. And I can always be reached on LinkedIn. Fantastic stuff. Well, as I say, pleasure once again for coming on the Huxley Morton podcast. You have a fantastic day. Thank and you, you too. Thank you both for inviting me to do this podcast with you. Uh, it's been uh, a brilliant experience and uh, I wish you all the best too. Pleasure, guys. Thanks, Freddie.